My name is Henry Stevens. I am a barrister at Trinity Chambers in Newcastle. I have a chancery and financial remedies practice, but I also deal with uh, matters relating to Talata, and obviously in this case, in contested probate. What I would like to do today is to present three recent cases, along with some refresher background to the 1975 Inheritance Act, um, which deal largely with claims by adult children. Those who are watching this or have an interest in these matters will know that there is a tension in the law's adherence to testamentary freedom and the, uh, the obligation in certain circumstances under the 75 Act for the testator to make uh, or for an intestacy to provide reasonable financial provision for the applicant. And that tension continues to inform the case law. Most all of you uh, will be familiar with the principles applicable to claims under the 75 Act, and, uh, and most certainly with uh, the, uh, the recent saga of uh, Eilot and Blue Cross, which is a, a decision of the uh, United Kingdom Supreme Court, uh, 2017. That was a claim specifically by an adult child. Nevertheless, the court did provide a lot of helpful guidance on how the court ought to approach a 75 Act claim generally. And from that decision, the following principles can be drawn. Uh, those are available in paragraph 16 to 25 of the judgment. The test is not whether the deceased has acted unreasonably, the correct test is an objective one. It's whether his dispositions in not making greater financial provision for the applicant have produced an unreasonable result. So an unreasonable or indeed a spiteful testator may have made reasonable financial provision for an applicant. Equally, a reasonable and caring testator may have failed to make reasonable financial provision. For similar reasons, it's not the purpose of the 75 Act to correct unfairness or to provide rewards for good conduct. Testamentary freedom remains paramount outside the limited ambit of the statutory provisions of the 75 Act. It's become conventional to treat the considerations of the claim as a two-stage process, namely, one, has there been a failure to make reasonable financial provision? And if so, two, what order ought to be made? However, as is regularly pointed out in texts and in the reported cases, in most cases there's a large overlap between these two stages uh, to which the section three factors are applied equally. And it's open to a judge to address both questions arising under the Act without repeating them. And what's required, in fact, is a rather broad brush approach to this two-stage test. If the conclusion is that reasonable financial provision has not been made, Needs are not necessarily the measure of the order to be made. Regard must be paid to each of the Section 3 factors, such as the beneficiary's needs and the estate size and nature. At this second stage, the court quantifies the provision to be ordered by reference to the test of reasonable financial provision. And that is either measured by the surviving spouse or the maintenance standard. Provision is to be judged based on evidence at the date of the hearing and not the time of death. Whether the best described as a value judgment or a discretion, each case turns on its own facts. And in determining whether reasonable financial provision was made, and if not, whether and in what manner to exercise its powers, the court must consider the following matters set out in section 3.1. Those matters are the resources and financial needs which the claimant has now and is likely to have in the foreseeable future, the financial resources and financial needs which any other applicant for an order under Section 2 of this Act has or is likely to have in the foreseeable future, the resources and financial needs which any beneficiary of the estate of the deceased has or is likely to have in the foreseeable future, any obligations and responsibilities which the deceased had towards the claimant or towards any beneficiary of the estate of the deceased, the size and nature of the net estate of the deceased, any physical or mental disability of any applicant for an order under the said Section 2 or any beneficiary of the estate of the deceased, and any other matter, including the conduct of the applicant or any other person, which in the circumstances of the case, the court may consider relevant. Now, ILOT is, uh, as I said, notorious. It also reinforces the idea that adult children of the deceased who have been and are capable of maintaining themselves um, 
should not necessarily be provided for out of the estate of the deceased. And very often, adult children are found to have difficulty succeeding with an inheritance claim. The three following cases offer a roundup of recent developments and each highlights particular approaches to the application and procedure uh, which is uh, adopted both by litigants and by the courts. And by and large, they prove the fact that although there is a reluctance to make awards for adult children, where there is genuine need, the court will do its best to do so. Turning then to the case of Fennessy and Turner and another, this is a 2022 case, the claim concerned the, uh, the estate of Hazel Valerie Fennessy, and she died in February 2020 at the age of 78. The claimant was her son, Patrick Fennessy, who was 60 years old. The deceased will, um, dated January 2012, left her entire estate to her daughter, Heidi, Patrick's, Patrick's sister, and appointed her as sole executrix. It provided that if Heidi predeceased her, then the whole estate was left to the defendant, June Turner, who was a local vet known to the family, who was also appointed as sole executrix. At the time of trial, Mrs. Turner was noted to have adequate means of support and did not need the money from the estate to support herself. Mr. Fennessy, by way of background, had been granted a 25-year lease of the family coal yard at a peppercorn rent. And at some point, his mother and his late sister Heidi, who predeceased his mother by six weeks, had assured him that he would inherit everything in due course. In 2011, it was suggested that Mr. Fennessy might move back in with, uh, with Hazel and Heidi, uh, an offer which he rejected. And the court considered it was likely that this discussion led to the mother and sister having wills drawn up that did not include him. Patrick was not told about the terms of the wills and continued in a dutiful relationship with his mother. In 2019, he said that he owned the freehold of the coal yard as part of a proposed planning application. Clearly, he didn't. This prompted his sister to want to cut him off, and she also influenced the mother not to contact him. Uh, his sister, as I've said, died shortly before the mother. Mr. Fennessy had limited means and lived very frugally. He was disabled effectively by osteoarthritis and only worked part-time in a pub. He had no prospect of increasing his hours and because of his health had no real prospect for improving his position. He lived in a motor home, which was regarded by the court as cold and damp and certainly not appropriate for someone suffering with his health problems. Hearing the case, Mr. Recorder Cameron found that considering the section three matters, the evidence clearly established that the claimant was in necessitous circumstances. Patrick's only possession in the world were the motorhome in which he lived, valued at £5,000, and savings of £3,500. Patrick earned £525 a month from his part-time employment, and it was accepted that he could not increase his hours. He lived exceptionally frugally and was dependent on the goodwill of the landowner on which his motorhome was parked for not charging rent. The motorhome was not adequate accommodation. The defendant, had not advanced any case on the basis that she had a need for the money in the estate. The indication to the claimant that he would inherit, which were never explicitly withdrawn, gave rise to a moral obligation, which was a material factor. Although the claimant was an adult son, he could not presently be said to be capable of living independently, and this was a factor which figured in the judgment. There was no suggestion that the deceased had any obligation towards the defendant, however. The size of the estate meant that it could easily meet the proposed award and still leave a substantial sum to be dealt with in accordance with the terms of the will. The claimant's osteoarthritis was a relevant factor in terms of his earning capacity and needs. The deceased and Heidi's attempts to cut themselves off from the claimant in 2019 probably more reflected Heidi's wishes than those of the deceased. And the claimant wanted to continue to have a normal relationship with his mother up until the time she died. Taking those factors and circumstances into consideration, the will did not make reasonable financial provision for the claimant. It should be noted there were several elements to the award that was made. A sum of £40,000 was awarded in respect of income deficit calculated to the age of 84, being the claimant's expected life expectancy. A sum of £120,000 was awarded to permit the claimant to rent accommodation for the next 10 years. It was not considered appropriate by the court to base this on life expectancy, given the vagaries of his future circumstances. No reduction for early receipt of these capital amounts was appropriate, 
given the combination of high inflation and low interest rates. The sum of £17,500 was awarded for the purchase of furniture and white goods for the new accommodation. And it was appropriate in principle for the success fee uh, to be added to the sum to be paid out of the estate. Uh, you'll note this obviously was a claim brought under a CFA. That decision was upheld before uh, Mr Justice Fancourt VC, uh, within which it was noted that although a little high, the award was well within the discretion of the court. The Vice-Chancellor found that uh, although he felt the award made by Mr Recorder Cameron was generous, uh, it was within what he called a generous ambit. And what we learn from this is that promises made to an adult child by a parent do not need to be set out with punctilious detail to make out a moral claim. The recorder properly found that the general promises made gave rise to a moral claim, although this was not a prerequisite to a successful claim. The Vice-Chancellor also noted that testamentary freedom was baked into the Inheritance Act and there was nothing to elevate testamentary wishes to greater importance comparative to the other factors for consideration. It's to be noted that Mrs Turner was made personally liable for the costs, largely on the indemnity basis, having rejected an early and modest Part 36 offer. Having complained at appeal that this left rather little of the inheritance, it was pointed out that the judgment made originally was blind to the effect of the Part 36 regime. Uh, the second case I wish to discuss today is the case of Dignam Thomas and McCourt, which is a 2023 decision, EWHC 546 family. This case is a further reminder that adult child cases are not impossible and are still relevant. The case was heard by Mrs Justice Tice, DBE, and was an application by Sally Ann Dignam Thomas and her sister Julie Catherine Bevington, two middle-aged sisters, both of whom were suffering financial and health difficulties, for reasonable financial provision from their father's estate. The estate had been left to their brother. The estate was limited, in essence, to the family home, which was valued at £355,000, and in which the claimant's brother resided. The application was limited to what was reasonable in all the circumstances for the sisters to receive from their maintenance. The Part 8 application seeking provision under the 75 Act was issued in June 2021. Leave to make the application out of time was sought. Uh, Mr Justice Roberts made an order on the 11th of August 21 that recited that the second defendant had not filed an acknowledgement of service and that his last known address was King's Road. Directions were made for a second defendant to be served personally at King Road and for him to file an acknowledgement of service by the 3rd of September 21 in accordance with CPR 57. A further order gave permission for the claimants to pursue their claims out of time and made directions for the filing of updated evidence and the matter to be listed for a one and a half day trial. The first defendant was the executor and the executor filed an acknowledgement of service dated 6th of October 21. The second defendant was served with the proceedings at the King Road property, which is the uh, former family home, uh, but no acknowledgement of service was filed. The deceased father had provided some support uh, of a financial nature to Sally Dignam Thomas, who was 61 at the time of the hearing. Sally had been a frequent visitor to her father and helped with personal care and medical appointments. Uh, she was also a carer for her husband and she had her own significant health needs. These affected her ability to undertake basic household tasks. They spent more than they received and were in debt. And although there was equity in their home of 86,000 pounds, they faced repossession proceedings. Her husband's shortened life expectancy meant she would at some point lose her pension income, or I should say his pension income. She made a claim against the executor and joining her brother and sought a capital payment out of her father's estate of £117,000. Julie Catherine Bevington, the sister, was a 67-year-old widow with adult children. She was almost blind, she had multiple other health problems and her children cared for her, but this was not a sustainable position in the long run. Julie claimed that she had a need for paid care and assistance for six hours a day. The court found that this was not unreasonable. Her relationship with and financial dependency upon the deceased was similar to those of the first claimant. She had a monthly income shortfall of £596 and had home refurbishment and wheelchair needs. She sought a payment of £114,300. 
So far, not much has been heard about the brother, and it's true that the hearing and the early litigation were marked by his non-participation and his alleged health problems. In the end, the trial went ahead without his participation. Uh, Mrs Justice Tice found that the will did not make reasonable financial provision for the claimants. The deceased had said he intended to make provision for them and also provide a home for their brother, but the will provisions benefited only the brother. There had been a two-way street of support between the claimants and the deceased, and the deceased had financially provided for them during his life. The court awarded the first claimant £70,000 so that she would end up with £150,000 once her house was sold. Once house sold and the debts were cleared, their income would be freed up. The second claimant would receive £90,000. Combined with equity release, she would end up with £190,000. Although the brother took no part in the proceedings, the court declined to treat him as a result of his non-participation as having no competing needs. He had his own unfortunate criminal history uh, and had had earlier convictions um, uh, of a sexual nature. Uh, the deceased had clearly wanted to secure housing for him. His income was believed to be £19,000 per annum and he could rent. His life expectancy was 14 years and a Duxbury fund for rental costs would give him £30,000. He would receive the balance of the estate after payment of the claimant's costs. The final case is the case of Sim and Pimlot, 2023, EWHC 2296, Chancery, uh, which initial case was heard on the 5th of May 2023. In this case, the High Court considered whether the wife of a deceased husband was justified in bringing a claim under the 1975 Act where testamentary gifts had been made to her but was subject to her not taking action under the Act. The deceased was a retired GP, and it's fair to say he had a, a rather checkered family life. He had had two marriages, an extramarital affair, and many children and grandchildren. It should be noted that upon his death, the claimant's spouse was in receipt of a widow's pension from the NHS of £1,750 per month. The deceased made his will upon moving into a care home at a time when his relationship with his wife was strained and he was subject to various serious allegations of rape, coercion and control and violence. He was 79 when he died and she was in her 60s. Those allegations were made by her during this time. The estate was worth £1,209,000 and included the matrimonial home and a property owned by husband and wife in Dubai. Critically, the deceased wished to make ob objectively reasonable provision for his wife and to provide for his various children and grandchildren. To this extent, he recited in his will a set of conditions precedent for the wife to take under the will, namely uh, the execution of a written deed of release by the wife of all rights she might have to a claim against his estate under the 75 Act, or otherwise to assert any claim or interest in relation to any asset owned by him at the date of his death, including his interest in his property in Dubai. And that was to be delivered by the wife to the husband's executors within two months of the date that such a deed was requested. And moreover, the vacating by the wife of the matrimonial home and the handing over of the keys thereto to the executors and fulfillment of the proviso set out in subclause 4.23. That being that the deceased gave subject to his wife um, fulfilling the conditions precedent, the sum of £250,000 absolutely. By clause 4.2.3, Dr. Sim gave a further £125,000 to his spouse and provided that within six months of the date of his death, she had done all acts and things that might be required in order to release her interest in the property in Abu Dhabi that I joined, owned jointly with her. This was defined as the Dubai property such that the entire beneficial interest in the Dubai property is free to pass and does in fact pass under the terms of this will and in accordance with Sharia law without my spouse to any extent benefiting therefrom. In addition to these gifts, uh, the wife was also made the tenant for life of the profits of the residue uh, and uh, the, the wife's claim basis in, in, in claim uh, when she brought this action was that no reasonable financial provision had been made for her. Well, after a four-day trial, the judge found that objectively the will made adequate provision for Mrs. Sim and that in the circumstances where provision made by the will was objectively reasonable, 
It was also reasonable to include a provision intended to discourage the relevant beneficiary from commencing an unwanted claim uh, with the attendant delay to the estate's administration and the distribution of assets to the beneficiaries and the cost consequences, obviously, of defending such a claim. Uh, this is an important point, and it's an area that's becoming more common. The judge also found that it would be wrong in principle to pursue a claim knowing that in doing so, uh, a party would, uh, would uh, forego a certain benefit, and then to say that because she's foregone that benefit, that the will failed to make reasonable financial provision for her. In one respect, the judge found that the will did fail to make reasonable financial provision, although entitled to a life interest in the residue of the estate, that was to the profits, but the will left the wife homeless since the matrimonial home had to be sold to fund all the legacies under the will. What was unreasonable was in failing to include a provision that if the wife failed to fulfill the conditions precedent, then she could require part of the capital to be applied in the purchase of a home for herself. Therefore, the judge exercised the court's power under Section 2 of the Inheritance Act to vary the trusts on which the estate was held to require the trustees to set aside a capital sum to provide a property for the wife to occupy rent-free as a life tenant. It has to be said that the judge was generally very critical of the wife, particularly her conduct towards her husband in the months before he died. However, there was a second cost hearing, uh, which is uh, to be found under the same name, uh, which was heard on the 15th of May 2023, in which the full cost consequences of that litigation were visited on the wife personally. The judge found that her conduct, both in bringing the case and ignoring a Part 36 offer, resulted in an order that the defendants, other than the fourth defendant who'd supported the wife's claim, have their costs on the standard basis up to the date when the 36 offer expired and on the indemnity basis thereafter. So pretty much the full consequences of losing the Part 36. The latter case is, is perhaps remarkable um, and, and is not likely to be the sort of case that parties will come across. The other two cases are perhaps slightly unusual because adult children do not generally uh, or, or are not generally encouraged to bring these sorts of claims. But when you see the facts of those cases, it's abundantly clear why they were brought and it's also abundantly clear why they were successful. Thank you.